And that concludes today's message. <laughs> I'm not going to let you out that easy, but uh, wow, huh? Yeah. Do, yeah, yeah, you're allowed to do that. Je- that makes Jesus smile. Do me a favor. Just close your eyes for just a second. Kind of do something that's come a little bit of a tradition when I get the opportunity to talk is I just want us to be quiet for a moment. And uh, I want us to get ready to receive. And I'm not making the assumption that what you're getting ready to receive is going to be as a result of something that I say. But I am making the assumption that the Spirit has you here for a reason this morning. That He wants you to receive something. It may happen while you're scrolling through Facebook. I don't know. But he's got you here for a reason. And what we can do sometimes is we can, we can rush in here, bring all of our craziness to the place, and not just take the time to be patient and quiet for a moment and be ready to receive. So do me a favor. Just take a big, deep breath with your eyes closed. Breathe out. Take another deep breath, and as you breathe out, just say to yourself this time, I receive, in Jesus' name. Now, I got to tell you, we as human beings, sometimes we can can have this tendency to, you know, um, lump all days into good days or bad days, depending on, you know, what transpired on that day. One of the, one of the terrible days in the life of, of of most of us that are in here today was September the 11th, and, and I hear me loud and clear um, when I say this. I am no way, shape, or form making light of, of the atrocities of that day, but this year on September the 11th, you know, um, um, I was kind of looking forward to it a little bit for personal reasons, not had nothing to do with what transpired on that date, okay? But just for, for, for personal reasons, I was looking forward to uh, that particular date, um, and the reason why I, I was is because my wife this year has just recently gone back uh, to full-time work. She's been working as a teacher's assist- assistant for a number of years, and this year she went full-time as a first-grade teacher. Uh, yeah. And see, that is really sweet, and I thank you for that. I do, but the reason why I'm most excited about it, and, and guys, um, gentlemen, you can probably, like, I know you're going to get excited about it. I, I'm excited because the paycheck. Can, can, can I get an amen for some money? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I, I was excited about the paycheck. I mean, I'm glad she's working with the kids and all. But, uh, but here's the deal. September 11th was the first paycheck. Yeah, full time, going to be awesome. I, I was looking forward to it. And, uh, and uh, it, was, it was September the 10th, and that night I was ironing some clothes, and as I was iron, ironing some clothes, I, I was thinking about this paycheck that was coming in the morning. And, I, I, you, know, you know how it is, right? Like you, you, when you've got money coming, you spend it, don't you? I was thinking about this paycheck, and then I started thinking about this, this, uh, this uh, conversation I'd had earlier that week here at the church building with some staff members, and, and all of a sudden it occurred to me, it's like maybe not, every, not all the payroll systems in the world work exactly like ours do. There could be different payroll systems, and maybe, maybe what I'm planning on won't happen, but oh no, don't worry about it, I'm spending. <laughs> and so I, I went to bed that night. And I got up the next morning, 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, that's, it's a true story. That's what's happening in our house right now. I get up at 4.30 in the morning, and, you know, you would probably think that, hey, listen, he's a pastor, so he just wakes up praising Jesus. I ain't going to lie to you. I rolled over, I grabbed my phone, and I, di- and I did a quick look at the bank account. I wanted to see how much money had done come in. I opened up, I looked at the bank account, and as I was looking at the bank account, getting ready to say praise Jesus, I was like, oh, me. Because guess what? When I looked at the bank account, it turned out that it was only half of what I was expecting. 
Now, I'm pretty good at, I'm pretty good at knowing, you know, exactly how much taxes are going to take out and all those types of things. I wasn't an accountant for a totally different payroll system. Half. I'm hurting right now, people. I need you to feel me. It was half. It was not good. Because I had hopes. I had dreams. I was believing big. And now this. How many of you, you've been there, right? Huh? Maybe not just with that kind of story, but you've been there. You've got hopes. You've got dreams. You get up every day, and you're looking forward to the future, and you cannot wait for that to happen, and that's what keeps you going. That's what keeps us putting one step, one foot in front of the other most of the time. And then this terrible thing hits called reality. Am I right? How many of you got some of this going on in your life? Some reality. You've got hopes and you've got dreams and then all of a sudden reality. And then, here's what happens. The distance between reality and hope is our suffering. Huh? The distance between reality and hope, that gap, however far that is, that is where our suffering lies. Here's what I want you to do. Take just a moment to think about all the hopes you walked in here this morning. There's been something that you've been hoping for. You've been hoping for. Do me a favor. Take your notes and write it down. What is that thing that you have been hoping for? You've been dreaming about. You've been looking forward to. Or maybe that thing you thought was going to happen. Just write it down. And now, the second thing I want you to do is write down your reality. This is my reality. I'm hoping for this, but this is where I really am. The distance between your reality and what you're hoping for is where all the suffering exists. And some of you walked in here today thinking we've started this brand new series called You're Invited. Dr. Drew talked about love last week. We're talking about joy today. Where's the joy? Where is the joy? When I started thinking about this message, I was really excited about getting the opportunity to be able to bring it to you. Because who doesn't want to talk about joy? Who? I mean, that sounds like a pretty easy subject matter, doesn't it? To be able to just kind of talk about, like, awesomeness? And how we could be feeling good all of the time. But the more that I thought about it, I thought, no, this is like a really hard message. The reason why it's a really hard message is because there's this thing called suffering that we go through. And most of us don't want to do the work that it takes to turn our suffering into joy. We don't want to do that hard work. We say that we want joy in our lives. We say that we want to be fulfilled and, and, and have contentment and just be able to live kind of in bliss. We say that we want those things, but we're not willing to do the hard work of really turning our suffering into joy. Because we're all going to suffer, aren't we? There is no going through this life without suffering. In fact, the only way to actually have joy is the fact that we've got to be able to turn what is our current reality into it and that's not the fun stuff that is not uh the hard work you know i'm not exactly sure what it what it would feel like to know that you're going to die most of us don't know that the large majority of the people sitting in this room we all know that we're going to die we just don't know when and we don't necessarily know how. And even people that are suffering with a terminal disease, oftentimes they don't even know like the exact point at which death is going to come. We, we, we don't know that. 
all of us just kind of have this hope and we have this dream that we're going to live this big, long life. And then we're going to be here for a long, long time. But we don't know, like, what it actually feels like on that day. And I don't know if you've ever taken the time to think about this, but I think, I'm pretty sure that by the time Jesus entered into his final day on planet Earth, that he had some revelation of the fact that this was it. That this was going to be the final day. That today was the last hurrah. Can you imagine what it would be like, what your day would be like if you woke up recognizing that this was it? That in less than 24 hours, you are going to die. I don't know if you've ever like, had to gear up maybe for a, a serious medical procedure or a surgery in your life, or you know somebody who's gone through something like that, or you've had a family member close that's gone through that. You, you know how that sits with you, right? Like that sits with you in, in terms of there's always this kind of impending dread that's just kind of heavy on you. And it doesn't matter what kind of conversations you're having. It doesn't matter what kind of movies you're watching. It doesn't matter what's going on in life. You've just got this feeling that that moment's coming. And it's just sitting there. Can you imagine what this day must have felt like for Jesus when he got up? When he recognized that his entire life's mission was now coming to a close. Here he was. He had come to this broken planet, to broken people, who he was tired of watching walk around in their misery and their suffering. And all he wanted to do was show us a better way. He was trying to show us that there was this way to turn our suffering into a thing called joy. And yet it had still brought him to this moment, this final day, where he was going to have to go through his own suffering. I mean, at that point, everything that you say during that day is going to be really important, isn't it? You're going to think about that. Jesus comes to the end of the day. He's there with his disciples. He's in the, he's, he's in the upper room. He pours out a, a, a huge amount of teaching to them, final reminders with the most important reminder being the reminder that, hey, listen, I, I need you guys to love one another the way that I've loved you. And then he, he gets up from that place, and he decides to go and have the most important conversation of the evening. He had all kinds of hopes in his human form. In his human form, he didn't want to go through what it was that he was about to go through. He wanted to continue to live. But he goes and he has this final conversation in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. And it says this, And they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray, because he took Peter and James and John with him. And he became deeply troubled and distressed. He felt every sense and every ounce of dread that you've ever felt in your life as you were looking at something impending that you didn't want to walk through. In fact, what Scripture is telling us here is, is, is that this was so heavy on him. Look what he says. He says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus was so crushed that the question was, would he even make it to the cross? I mean, this type of stress can lead to heart attacks, folks. This type of stress can lead to all kinds of other forms of death. This is the type of stress that Jesus was under as he was thinking about what it was that he was about to have to go through. Because as a human being, he had hopes. But as God, there was another reality. And he went a little farther and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if it were possible that this awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Whatever happens, please don't let this happen. And then he prayed. Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will 
to be done, not mine. Folks, he was about to suffer crucifixion. He was about to go through the worst of the worst. You think you've got it bad. You say, hey, listen, you know, I may already know the way that I'm going to potentially pass away. Jesus did too. I know how this is going to end. Jesus did too. Jesus was going to end in crucifixion. The most torturous form of death that mankind has probably ever thought up. And I won't take you through the gory details. This is what he knew he was headed to face. And he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. It's in that prayer. It's in that prayer that I think Jesus gives us the formula of how to turn our suffering into joy. You say, is Jesus going to feel any joy in this later on? Later on, we're going to hear the Apostle Paul that says, because of, it was the joy of the cross that brought him through this. Is Jesus going to find joy in this? He will, but there's, some, there's something in this prayer that is going to allow him to be able to experience the joy to come. There's something in this prayer that if we'll follow the same pattern, the same pattern that Jesus did, will allow us to experience joy in the middle of what we would otherwise call our suffering. The first thing that I see that Jesus was willing to do is he was willing to accept the reality of right now. He was willing to find acceptance in the moment. Most of us aren't willing to do that, are we? We're not willing to just look at whatever the situation is that we're going through and just say, hey, this is what it is. Jesus was willing to look and say, crucifixion is coming. Okay. Not my will, but yours be done. Whatever is going to happen is what is going to happen. How do we accept our reality? We've got to learn how to move toward the moment. The moment that we're in right now. Not some future moment because a whole lot of us spend our lives suffering on the cross of the future. We allow ourselves to be crucified on the cross of the future, meaning that we're always thinking about the future. We're anxious about the future. We're anxious about our retirement. We're anxious about how that relationship is going to happen. We're anxious, 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 and we're suffering, 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 aren't we? Because we're constantly worried about the future. Either that or... Or we allow ourselves to consistently be crucified on the cross of the past. Always looking backwards, always looking at regret, always looking at hurt, always looking at old resentments. And we just relive those things over and over again. We suffer, suffer, suffer because of our past. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ died on the cross in the center so that we never have to worry about the past or the future. All we have to do is live right here, right now with Jesus. No matter what it is that you may be going through, what you have in this moment is this moment. What are you going to make of it? Not the moment that hap- that's going to happen 10 seconds from now. Not the moment that just happened 10 seconds ago. But you've got this moment. You've been given this breath. What are you going to do with it? Jesus died so none of those things would ever have to be worried about again. Jesus in this moment in the garden accepts the reality for what it is. He says, okay, let it be. It is. And he gave us a pathway to accept our own suffering. I got to tell you, as a recovering alcoholic, when I was beginning recovery, the last thing that I wanted anybody to ever say to me were the words of, take it one day at a time. Just take it one day at a time. What do you mean, take it one day at a time? Don't you know there's a future to be planned for? 
Don't you know there's work to be done? Take it one day at a time. What do you mean I'll never get to drink, have another drink again? Have you lost your mind? I mean, not even a little sip at New Year's Eve? No. What does that mean? It seemed like too much until I recognized I didn't have to worry about the rest of my life. All I had to do was make it through lunch. And from that point then, all I had to do was make it through the afternoon. And then all I had to do was make it through dinner. And then make it to bed and get up and do it again the next day. And ladies and gentlemen, how is that any different? How is this alcoholic's life any different than yours? That's all you got to do is get up and make it through right now. We have no idea what the future holds, so why worry about it? Why live in it? The past is over. Nothing can be done to change it. Jesus, here, now, provides the way forward. I'm reminded of this because someone incredibly special in my life, uh, the first time I had the opportunity to, 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 to get up and preach again here at the Church of Seven Run after my recovery, brought me a gift. Don't you like it? They gave this to me right after I got done speaking, and, and it's been very, very special to me ever since that day, except there's one caveat to this. Um, this is the 18th iteration of this plant. <laughs> this is not the original. The original was a beautiful bonsai tree. And the other 17 leading up to it were also beautiful. The issue is I, I asked Gwen to help me take care of it. <laughs> so that's the reason why this is number 18. Now, whether this thing sits in, in my office or if it's in Gwen's office taking care of it, uh, i got to tell you what, it's important to me because it reminds me of Matthew 6.28. That's where Jesus is kind of talking about this whole issue of anxiety and worry and all the stuff that we put ourselves all the time. In that particular verse, Jesus says, hey, how about the lilies of the field? And the lily in the field has a lot better chance of surviving than a bonsai tree in Gwen's office. But how about the lilies of the field? What do they do? They just sit there and they look beautiful. And while they're sitting there just being and looking beautiful, we walk by and we look at them and we say, aren't they beautiful? But they are not worried a thing about tomorrow. And they're not worried a thing about yesterday. All they got to do is just sit there in the now. And that's why I'm glad, that's why we keep buying more of them. Because every time I look at it, every time like I get stressed out, I remind myself, all i got to do is sit there and be that right now. Just be planted inside of Jesus. Just be okay with this moment. And that's all that matters. Because that's all I've got. Isn't that what Jesus is saying to his father right now as he's sitting in this garden? He tells us that we've got to just accept this moment for what it is. The second thing that I think is here in this prayer, and it's something that's there, uh, not necessarily explicitly, but I get the fact that it's there kind of implicitly as Jesus speaks to his Father. There's a certain feeling of gratitude that's going into this prayer. As tough as this prayer is, as bad as the suffering is going to be, there is this implicit attitude of gratitude that Jesus is, is expressing. Number one, how do I know that? Because number one, he's just talking to his Father. Right? He's doing the opposite of what most people do when we face suffering. Most people, when we face suffering, the first thing that we want to do is somebody's got to be the blame for this. Right? Somebody has got to be the blame for this. We immediately look and it may be our spouse that is the blame for this. It may be our boss that's the blame for this. 
It could be a friend. It could be a family member. It could be your church. We find a way when something's bad is going on with us, we find a way to make it somebody else's fault. And we immediately look and say, hey, it's your fault. And a lot of times, more times than not, we look at God and say, God, this is your fault. That's not what Jesus does as he's moving toward the suffering, is it? Jesus goes to the Father. He goes to the Father, and then look at how he addresses him. He says, Abba, Father, Daddy. He implies this closeness. He implies gratitude in the fact that he can come to him, sit down and have this conversation, even though this is crazy suffering that he's about to go through. Gratitude is everywhere to be found in what's going on. So how do we find gratitude in the middle of suffering? How, how, how do we explore that? If, if we can find acceptance by being in the moment, how do we find gratitude in it? Well, most of us do it. We just don't, we just don't finish it. Most of us start the process of finding gratitude. We just don't, go, we just don't take it all the way to the end. Because the start of the process to finding gratitude is doing what we do. Usually we ask, why me? Don't we? The moment that suffering comes, the moment that something doesn't turn out exactly how we want it to turn out, our first question is usually, well, why? Why me? And even though you might have been told by by people in religious life that that's not an appropriate question, I'm here to tell you it's exactly the right question. The right question when you get ready to face suffering is, okay, why me? It's okay to ask that. Jesus asks it on the cross, doesn't he? My father, why hast thou forsaken me? Why me? It's an appropriate question. It's appropriate response. The problem is most of the time we don't finish it. Because... There's a truth that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Did you hear that? It doesn't matter what it is that you're facing. And none of us are going to face crucifixion in our lifetimes. That's very, very doubtful. So none of us have got it as bad as Jesus in this prayer. And yet all things, including crucifixion, work together for the good. The question of why me is the fact that you shouldn't just ask the question and walk away from God at that moment. Ask the question and wait. Ask the question, why me, and wait. Because there is something good somewhere in this for you. There is something good in this for the future of your family. There is something good in this for other people. But most of the time, we just ask why, and then we run away. We don't even give God the chance to answer the question because we want the answer right now. We want to we understand in this very moment. But sometimes God waits a while before he answers that question, and sometimes he may not even answer that question on this side of planet Earth. But... The question will be answered if you'll have the faith to wait for him to answer it. There's a young lady that I had the opportunity to meet just a couple of years ago. She actually attended here at the, at the Church of Severn Run. And, uh, but I did not meet her in the context of the Church of Severn Run. I actually met her outside of, of the church um, in terms of the fact that I was going one day, had to have uh, some physical therapy done, and I walk into the physical therapist's office, and it was like, hey, Pastor John. I'm like, hey, do we know each other? And before long, uh, we started having this conversation, and um, it turns out I, I knew who she was. I just didn't know her name. I didn't know, I didn't know, you know what she looked like. I'd never seen her before, but I'd heard her story. She'd been attending the Church of Seven Run a couple years before that, and, and, uh, and the story goes that her and her husband had moved to this area. Young lady, her and her husband had moved to this area because he had cancer and was being treated at John Hopkins. They moved here specifically for treatment. 
And as, as the story kind of goes, they, they met, you know, they fell in love, young love, beautiful thing. Thought they were going to do their whole lives together. He ends up with this debilitating, debilitating cancer, and, and she goes ahead, and they say, I do, in spite of all of that. They then move here and joined a connect group and lots of prayers were prayed for them. And I remember, this is how I remember hers because we as a staff, we prayed for her and we prayed for her husband and we prayed for healing and we asked God to do something. And you know what? When it was all said and done, God did. God took her husband home. And here she was now and... I was beginning to get to know this young lady. Not too long ago, she moved. And I was on the phone this last week with her, just kind of seeing how she was doing. And we were talking, and she said, John, she goes, it's just been crazy since I moved back home. She said, you know, just these opportunities to speak into the lives of people that are going through uh, suffering in terms of losing their, their, their husbands is crazy. She's like, it's like every time I, I walk around, walk into somebody. She said, I just had an old friend from high school, just lost her husband. She said, me and another girl, we're going to get together, and I think we are going to, I think we're going to start a YouTube channel in which we can just kind of minister to women who are going through what it is that we're going through. I thought, wow. None of us in here in any way, shape, or form, would have blamed her if she had just called it quits on love, would we? Would we? If, 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 if she was just to, you know, lay down and give up, we'd all look and say, we understand that. But you know something? She asked the question, why? And she's waited for the answer. Because all things work together for the good. Good can come out of all of our suffering. But we got to wait for the answer. And then finally, look at Jesus. Jesus keeps on stepping, doesn't he? He has faith. Not only does he accept the moment that he's in, not only is he gracious and, and has gratitude for the moment that he's in, but Jesus has faith. And let me go ahead and tell you what faith is not. Faith is not just looking at a situation and saying, you know what, I believe the best for the future. That is not faith. That is false faith. Faith is saying, I believe the best for the future, even though this moment looks absolutely disastrous, I believe the best for the future and I'm going to keep walking. I'm going to keep moving. Oh, is this bad? Okay, let's go. Oh, does this hurt? Is this painful? Let's do it. Faith keeps walking. Jesus walks out of the garden, folks. He doesn't go hiding an olive tree. He doesn't go running up the side of the mountain trying to escape what is coming. Jesus keeps walking. Jesus walks all the way to the cross. He walks all the way to the cross. What should you do when you're suffering? Keep walking. Get up tomorrow and take another step. And when that doesn't look like things are getting any better, take another step. And keep taking step after step after step. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep moving. Jesus walks all the way to the cross. Because unless you walk to the cross, there is no resurrection. Acceptance, gratitude, faith. Keep walking. Your resurrection is coming. In Jesus' name. Thanks so much for watching today's message. If Severn Run is having impact on your life, we'd love for you to consider financially supporting the work we do here. There's two ways to do it, and it's super easy. The first one is to go to severnrun.com slash give, and the second is to text the dollar amount you wish to give to 410-844-GIVE. You can also spread this message even further by sending it to your friends and your family. And we'd love to see you right here on our campus one day. 
We always say we want to love well, live Jesus, and believe big every Sunday when we go out of here. So we hope that you get the chance to do that this week. Have a great week.